start the slideshow. Got it. All right. So thank you so much for the invitation today. I was so excited. Uh, I recently moved back, well, not recently, a few years now, I moved back to Colorado where I'm originally from. Uh, and yes, yeah, so I did my PhD at the University of Maryland, uh, graduated in 2018. And I'm teaching at Colorado State University and I just absolutely love it. I get to teach things like insect identification and general entomology, uh, but I still uh, have a great love for gall wasps. They are uh, probably some of my favorite insects in the whole world. So, um, oh, sorry, went one slide too many. So when I talk about gall wasps, I am referring to the family Cynipidae. Uh, and so this is a group of wasps um, that we commonly refer to as gall wasps. There are some other gall-inducing wasps. I'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, but for the most part, I'm interested in uh, the oak gall wasps. And uh, so what a gall wasp is, is it is a tiny little parasitic wasp. Uh, you can see a picture on the top right there. And uh, they're stingless wasps, so they are not capable of stinging you, and they're really small. But they lay their eggs inside of uh, the plant tissue, in this case an oak tree. And uh, then when that egg hatches, the larva exists inside of this little tumor-like growth that we call a gall. And I say tumor-like because uh, it's something that the tree can't control, but uh, it's unlike a tumor and that these tissues are actually very specialized. And we'll talk about the specialization of these tissues in a moment. But so in that case, it's kind of unlike a tumor, uh, but I say tumor-like just because it's something that the tree cannot control. And uh, so they live inside of this gall structure uh, throughout their development. Once they finish their development, uh, they chew their, they pupate, and then they chew their way out of the gall once they emerge as an adult. And then they start the whole cycle over again. Now, uh, what's interesting is that these galls are so interesting looking and so complex in this group of wasps that uh, it's considered the secondary phenotype. And what I mean by that is so a phenotype is basically the way an organism looks. It's a certain classification, basically, as far as this is how we think um, this particular phenotype, this particular appearance in this case, belongs to this organism. And the galls are so unique looking that it is considered the extension of the wasp itself. And we'll take a look at what some of these galls are shaped like. They are, come in an amazing variety of shapes, textures, colors. Uh, and uh, they exist on a whole lot of different tissues on the host plant. And uh, to me, they just are so charismatic and so interesting. When you see things like this on a plant, obviously it's something that's kind of strange and so it's worth taking a, stopping and taking a look at. Uh, and so yes, these are considered the secondary phenotypes or an extension of the wasp itself. Now there are, other wasps and other insects and other organisms that can cause galls. But uh, today I'm gonna to be concentrating up on the cynipid gall wasps and particularly looking at those that attack oaks and their kin. However, there are also cynipid gall wasps that attack roses um, and other uh, shrubs. And then there's some that attack herbaceous plants as well. Uh, those are not quite as diverse as the oak gall wasps and they're not quite as well studied as the oak gall wasps. Uh, but they are definitely around. There are some non cynipid gall wasps um, or gall inducing wasps, and uh, these are usually nested within uh, groups of other parasitic wasps. So these are wasps that usually would attack and kill other insects, but then, like one group or two groups here and there. Um, of all, all the ability um, to induce galls. And these groups usually attack different trees and, uh, trees and shrubs. Now, another huge group of gall makers are gall flies. And the gall flies um, are extremely diverse. 
uh, one of the largest groups of flies in existence. Uh, but they also um, can gall a lot of herbaceous plants, including crops. They're very important pests in crops. And then uh, there are definitely species that will attack trees and shrubs. So it's a very diverse group. And then there are other gall makers, such as fungi and bacteria and nematodes. And then there's a few other groups of insects, um, some of the true bugs, uh, and then some of the moths as well will also occasionally induce galls. So this has evolved multiple times uh, within insects. Uh, but the stars, other than the gall flies, as far as um, the gall flies usually make more of a simple gall, the oak gall wasps and the other gall wasps, um, the other cynipid gall wasps, they create the most complex galls that we know. Now, as far as the hosts for the group that I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to concentrate on the oak gall wasps because uh, they're so diverse and there's about a thousand species that are known uh, and they uh, create such amazing structures that this is kind of the group that I want to concentrate on. So it's the family Cynipidae and within that there's a subgroup called a tribe and it's the tribe Cynopiny. So these are the oak gall wasps. And so oaks are the genus Quercus. And so all oaks um, are potential hosts for the oak gall wasps. There are some in the subgenus Cyclobalanopsis that is off to the uh, right here um, that we're not gonna talk about tonight, uh, but there's some species that don't have uh, quite as many galls and gall wasps on them as some of the species that we're gonna talk about in the subgenus Quercus. The subgenus Quercus is what most of us think about when we think of oaks. And it is divided into different sections. And I'm only talking about this because I want to uh, mention, uh, I'm going to classify the types of galls that I want to talk to you about in Maryland based on the section of oaks that they're in. So first we have the section Quercus. So yes, that is genus Quercus, subgenus Quercus, section Quercus. <laughs> and these are the white oaks. And this can be kind of confusing because there's also a species of oak within this section called white oak. And usually when you say it's singular, you're talking about the species white oak. However, when scientists say it plural, we're usually talking about this whole section, which is made up of things like white oak, but also bur oak, swamp white oak, chestnut oak, and many, many others. This is actually a huge group um, of oaks. The next section is lobitae, and these are the red oaks. So the white oaks in general, especially in your area up in Maryland, uh, they're gonna be the ones that have, uh, so all oaks are usually lobed, they're, the leaves are lobed, and the white oaks will have rounded lobes, but the red oaks will have pointed lobes, or at least points on their lobes. And so those are the red oaks, and then we have some other sections, uh, but they're not going to be in your part of the country. Uh, if you come out toward out west towards California, you're going to run into some of the protobalanus oaks. Uh, and then down in the southern U.S. and then even further south, you get the tropical and subtropical section Berentes. And these are the live oaks. So these are the ones that keep their leaves throughout the winter. And they have some very interesting uh, wasps on them as well. And then the last section we're not going to talk about at all. There's only one species of that section in the U.S., uh, but it's just kind of a weird species that you'll find in California. So for Maryland and your guys's area, we're going to concentrate on these two sections: section Quercus and section Lobitae. But first, we're going to talk about. So I told you, like, I've defined what a gall is. But a lot of people, one of the first questions is why? Like, why do they do this? It's kind of strange. And there's two main um, hypotheses as far as why. The first being nutrition. So basically, they're creating a food source that will provide for that larva throughout its entire development. And that is a very valuable resource to have, basically a somewhat endless food supply. The other hypothesis is that the galls um, evolved out of protection, uh, protecting the wasp larva while it develops. Uh, and to be 
frank it's probably a combination of both uh galls uh do you know help with nutrition but they also do help um, in many cases uh protect them from different natural enemies however it does also kind of make them susceptible because they can't move <laughs> as far as how they make their galls we don't really know for sure but what we do know is what it's not <laughs> So we know it's not a natural defense of the plant. A lot of times plants will have this natural defense where if something's invading them, they'll push the tissue away, isolate it and try and basically clip that tissue off of the main part of the plant. And that sounds like it could be something that they're doing with gall wasp. However, if that was the case, you would expect all galls to look the same because the plant's in control. However, since all galls look different, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, uh, we know that it's specific to the gall wasp. It's the gall wasp that's in control. Now, there's also been um, a lot of questions about, you know, I mentioned that there's some bacteria and fungi that can cause galls. And so um, there's been some interest in whether or not the gall wasps are using those as symbionts to induce the gall. So it wouldn't be the wasp itself, it would be something, another organism that they're using. But so far we have been completely unable to find any third party symbiont. And we've done a lot of research into that. Um, on that same note, we haven't been able to find any virus-like particles um, that would be inducing the galls. And another thing that they've looked at is whether or not the gall wasps can create plant hormones. And no, so far we haven't seen that, but I'll talk about, uh, so what we, you know, in addition to that, we don't really know exactly how they're doing this. However, we do have some theories about how in, um, the galls are being induced. So we know that the gall wasp larvae are secreting these proteins out into the plant tissue around them. And these are believed to be what we call effector proteins um, that the plants that they are exporting and the plant would use. Uh, so it's not quite a hormone, but it's something that the plant in the presence of that protein would start uh, doing something in particular. It would have a particular response. And in this case, the induction of a gall. And what they think is that it's kickstarting what we call the seed developmental cascade. And this is a cascade. So basically it turns on different genes that are involved with developing seeds. And so in every tissue, for the most part, throughout the plant, they have this genetic material. It's just in most tissues, it's turned off all the time. It's only turned on in the flowers at the right time of year. And so what we think the gall wasps are doing is they're kickstarting this developmental cascade, turning on these genes somehow, but they're doing it in inappropriate tissues, such as twigs and leaves. And the reason why we think that this is happening is because of the similarities between seeds and galls. So if we look at seeds, the outermost layers are where we have most of the plant toxins. So plants create specific toxins to protect themselves primarily from insects. Uh, us as humans, we have livers that are able to process a lot of these toxins and actually things like the carotenoids and flavonoids, we love them, that's what gives our food flavor. Uh, but for insects, they're not able to uh, process very many of these in some cases, especially if they're specialists. And so there's this seed is you know, contained within this big toxic layer. And then within that, you have a nutritive layer called the endosperm. And that nutritive layer supplies the inner embryo throughout its development. Similarly, in galls, the outer layer of the gall, um, the parenchyma tissue of the plant, um, is filled with a lot of tannins as well as phenolics. And uh, you think most people are familiar with tannins because of wine. Um, and some of us like the tannins, some of us don't like as much tannins in our, or as many tannins in our wine. Uh, but these are chemicals that are actually highly toxic to most insects. And this outer layer of the gall is very rich in tannins. 
And it's actually so rich in tannins that it has increased the pH of the outer layer significantly. There's actually a recent study um, that was looking at their the outer layer of galls can sometimes be as acidic as um, uh, pitcher plants. Um, and they're, you know, and th those are plants that have the ability to digest insects. So, I mean, this is a very, uh, not <laughs> very friendly part of the gall, let's just say that. <laughs> Within that, we have a small nutritive layer. And then in the middle, instead of an embryo, we have the gall wasp. It's an inappropriate tissue. So no embryo is gonna be created. And instead it's supplying this gall wasp with that nutritive layer. So this is kind of a really cool parallel. And this is why we think that uh, basically galls are structurally basically seeds in an inappropriate tissue. Another question that I get frequently now that we've gone over what a gall is, is whether or not it hurts the trees. And yes and no, I mean, it does use up some resources uh, that does kind of create a wound where in one particular case we have seen um, uh, either a bacteria or a virus entered through that wound of the gall after the gall wasp exited and the trees became sick. So, I mean, there's a potential for some damage to be caused there. However, rarely do gall wasps do any noticeable um, damage as far as causing decline of the trees. There are a couple exceptions, the main one being the chestnut gall wasp, which is a species that's native to um, China. And it's an invasive species in many parts of the world, including the US. Uh, and it can actually, because uh, chestnuts um, is a big crop, and it completely it can completely wipe out your harvest. Uh, use this wasp can, so it can be pretty damaging in that case. Other than that, there's only a couple other species uh, that have known to cause severe damage to trees. Um, however, when you move a tree outside of its native range. Uh, then you can start to cause problems because you oftentimes you don't take all the natural enemies of the gall wasp with the tree. And at that point, the gall wasp can become kind of out of control. And that's what I'm seeing here in Colorado. We have the non-native bur oak, which is native in your area, um, but we don't have all the natural enemies for this one particular gall wasp. And so they're kind of just like going out of control. Uh, it's becoming a big problem uh, with homeowners um, around the area, but like I said, this is relatively rare, and this was our own fault for doing that. <laughs> um, also, trees that are already stressed or in decline um, can also sometimes be affected by gall wasps. So. But there are some benefits for gall wasps. Um, the larvae in particular are a very important food source. Uh, I love watching squirrels just go and pluck the galls and rip them open and get the little larva out from the inside. Uh, woodpeckers love galls, uh, especially the woody twig galls. Uh, and then also some galls are able to secrete a uh, sugary secretion from the sur surface of the gall. And there's a whole wide variety of insects, including ants that harvest these secretions and it's actually a mutualism with ants because then the ants protect the galls because it's their food source. And it is a very interesting relationship between those gall wasps and those ants. And then once the gall wasp leaves the gall, when it becomes an adult and it chews its way out, uh, that abandoned gall, if it's the type that remains on the tree, um, it can become a shelter for a lot of different organisms. Uh, down in Texas, there's a uh, certain ant species that actually create their nests inside of used galls. It's interesting because if you go and collect, I, sometimes I collect old used galls that there's nothing inside of anymore. Um, but in Texas, I learned you have to kind of give them a little bit of a tap first um, and wait for the ants to come out. <laughs> uh, because yeah, there's definitely a lot of ants inside some of those large galls in Texas. Um, and then also just other benefits as far as our uses for them. Throughout history, we've used galls, uh, particularly to make ink, um, our own Declaration of Independence, um, and I believe our Constitution are also writ are both written in gall ink. Um, and then also because of the high level of tannins in the galls, 
um, you can use that for tanning leather. That's actually where they got the term from. Um, and so uh, traditionally we've used galls for these purposes. Um, but also I like to think about, so if we're inducing a seed-like structure on an inappropriate tissue, if we can learn how to do that, what implications would that have for technologies in medicine production and perhaps even food production? Think about how many vegetables that we get, like broccoli um, is the same plant um, as cabbage. And it's just different parts of the plant that we bred to be larger. But if we can induce a large growth that might be edible and very tasty to us, and we might be able to create some novel food sources on other plants. So just kind of interesting to think about. Now, as far as who comes out of galls, it's a little more complicated than you might think. It's not just the gall makers. Uh, you do tend to have gall makers. Uh, they're the most common things that usually come out of the galls. Um, and so a couple terms for that, um, if it's one wasp that comes out of a single gall, then it's called a monothalamus gall. Um, otherwise, if you get multiple wasps that come out of a single gall, you'll call that a polythalamus gall. And so you can get one or many gall wasps out of a gall. And then uh, also there are gall wasps called inquilines. And these are really funky little wasps that have uh, lost the ability to induce their own galls, but still need them for their development. So they lay their eggs inside the galls of other gall wasps, <laughs> usually actually killing the initial gall maker. Um, but as long as the gall was induced, the inquiline gall wasp is happy living there. <laughs> and then there's also parasitoid wasps. So these are parasitic wasps that attack and kill other insects. And there's a whole group of them that are concentrated and specialized on gall wasps. And so um, on the right, I kind of have those pictures, you know, the gall wasp at the top, inquiline in the middle, and then the parasitoid, the beautiful metallic parasitoid at the bottom. And one thing that's interesting is that you can have parasitoids that would attack either the gall inducer or the inquiline. And technically, you also have what we call hyperparasitoids that attack the parasitoids that attack the galls <laughs> or the gall makers. So you can get a whole lot of diversity out of a single gall. It is amazing. Um, and sometimes those parasitoids, even if there was only one gall maker, sometimes you can get multiple parasitoids because they lay multiple eggs. So um, very interesting as far as what we can get out of galls. So already you can kind of see galls are becoming this really complex system um, involving many organisms. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to the system. So the life cycle of gall wasps is really important, um, particularly for what you're looking at um, when you're looking at the gall, you have to kind of look at what time of year it is um, and whatnot. So this species that's in this picture uh, is on Baroque. So you'll find this in your area. This is Dishel Caspis Quercus mama. And it creates this little woody round twig gall that you see on the left. And then the wasp that comes out of it is shown at the top. You'll find these throughout the summer developing and then they emerge in the fall. And they're only females. There are only female wasps that come out of these galls and they're, they reproduce asexually, so without any sort of fertilization. And they just immediately go and start ovipositing or laying their eggs inside of dormant buds. Um, and they'll stay in those buds throughout the winter. And for probably almost a hundred years, well, actually more than a hundred years, I think probably close to 115 years, we thought this was what defined that species. Like we thought this was all there was for that species. But during my master's degree, we realized that we were missing half the picture. So while that asexual female laid her egg in that dormant, uh, dormant bud, in the spring, when that bud first starts to open, you find a little kernel, looks like a grain or like a little piece of rice, nestled down in the middle, and that's the gall of the sexual reproducing generation that exists in the spring. 
So this generation, you have both males and females. And it's interesting because like aphids do something similar where they pop out males as often as they need them genetically. But for gall wasps, this is a strict alternation. You get one right after the other. Um, and so in the spring generation, you get these little males and females that come out, they mate. And then the female will go and lay her eggs inside of the newly developing twigs, which then gives rise to the twig gall that we were so familiar with. And so we went so long without knowing this other half of the life cycle. Um, and what's interesting is what this means is that if a particular host plant has 30 species of gall wasp on it, well, that really means that there's probably at least 60 different types of galls because each species of gall wasp is expected to have this alternation. But for most species, we only know half the life cycle. And so this is an area where as you're making observations on oak trees, you could help us discover these sexual generations and help us, you know, link everything together and, you know, say, oh, this wasp over here, you know, is actually the sexual generation for this wasp over here. And so that's an area where you can actually really help. And just, I do want to mention that this uh, 30 species of gall wasp on a, you know, single species of oak tree, that is not uncommon. That may sound like a lot, but it's really not. Uh, and I'll explain to you why and how we can have this amount, like this just amazing diversity of wasps attacking a single species of oak. Uh, but another thing before I get into that, that I wanted to mention that's important about um, the life cycles is that sometimes certain species, um, and particularly one genus, Calaritis, uh, their different generations use different host plants. <laughs> So you'll find the fall gall on one species of host tree and you'll find the spring gall on a different host species. And it's very hard for us to, I mean, without genetic tools, there's really no way for us to link this all together. It's just too complex. And so, um, and we need help finding specimens. <clears throat> um, and this is just, yeah, very complex system. So as far as how, we can get so much diversity of gall wasps on these oaks. Uh, well, most oak gall wasps are very host specific. And what I mean by that is that they can only attack maybe one to a few species of oaks. Now there are some oak gall wasps that are generalists. Oftentimes these are the ones that attack the red oaks, uh, but there's also another genus, um, Neuroderus. Uh, that tends to be more of a generalist. So they can attack maybe like seven different species of oaks. Uh, but most of them, for example, the rough bullet gall wasp um, that I talked about um, that I did my uh, master's research on, uh, it attacks uh, bur oak, swamp white oak, and overcup oak. Um, and so at the bottom, those are the leaves that are highlighted in purple. Uh, and so these are all oaks that are actually really closely related to each other. And if you're familiar with your oaks, you'll know that these are oaks, oak species that uh, hybridize frequently with each other as well. Um, and so it can actually be kind of hard to identify some of these hybrids uh, because they have shared parentage. Um, but what's interesting is, uh, so like, how, why, how do these gall wasps know one species from another? And one thing I want to mention is that uh, they are better oak taxonomists and better oak identifiers than we are. Oaks are particularly hard because of the hybridization um, to identify. However, each oak species has a specific chemical cocktail of all of those tannins and phenolics and so it smells and tastes very specific, very different from everything around it. And that those oak gall wasps, they have these uh, organs, these chemoreceptors that can pick up on those chemical cues. And so when you get something, if you get a gall wasp that normally attacks white oak, Quercus alba, and we've started hybridizing English oak with that oak to create um, horticultural oaks, uh, up until recently, we haven't seen gall wasps attacking those hybrids. 
at least not in this country. They are these North American gallwas. They smell that, you know, the p- parentage of the English oak, and they're like, "What is that? That's not food." And so, uh, they are very sensitive to these chemical differences. The other thing with this, so as far as them being host specific, they're also specific to the tissue in which they gall. So I already talked about a twig galler um, that does the twig galls in the summer and fall, and then um, the bud gall in the spring. Well, we have uh, twig galls, we have lots of leaf galls. You can get species that only attack the bottom side of leaves, whereas other species only attack the top. Um, you get ones that attack um, the mid ribs or veins in the leaves and the ones that won't attack those areas. And so they've like divided up all of the oak tissues and basically created all these little ecological roles, which we call niches, um, because they're so specialized. And so there's lots of niches to fill. And that's how we've gotten this huge diversity of gall wasps. And so each oak, um, it's common to see anything between 10 to 40 species of gall wasps on a tree or on a given oak species. Um, and so uh, that can, you know, vary. Some of the ones that have fewer gall wasps on them, I have to kind of wonder if it's mainly because they're not as studied as well. Um, but we definitely can see more than this as well in certain species of oaks. So for you, as naturalists Crystal, going up. Oh, go ahead. There was just one question oh, on that last screen. Why was the one gall hairy? <laughs> we think that some galls are hairy because uh, for defensive strategies. I mentioned those little parasitoid wasps that are coming to kill all the gall wasps. Well, they have a hard time getting through like hairs and sticky substances. Um, and so these are some of the um, defensive strategies um, that gall wasps can like make their galls do the, these things um, to help protect the developing larva inside. So yeah, it's a defensive thing. Um, and then also sometimes you'll get galls that get really thick walls. And then the only parasitoids that can reach the larva are the ones that have really long ovipositors, which are the part of the body that lay the egg. So there's a lot of defensive maneuvering going on with balls. Great question. So with you guys going out to identify and observe galls on your own, some things that you need to know is that the species of host plant is extremely important because they're so host specific. It really helps us narrow it down. Um, but I, I did say oak identification can be particularly hard. However, the galls are actually one of the easiest parts to identify. So sometimes you can even identify the oak based on the galls that are on it, if you're good enough at identifying your galls. Um, and the galls are definitely easier to identify than the wasps themselves. So the taxonomy, <clears throat> excuse me, the taxonomy of most gall wasps, and uh, particularly in North America, um, not so much in Europe, um, but it's been highly neglected. So we had um, like C.P. Gillette um, and Ashmead that studied gall wasps in the late 1800s. Um, then we had like Weld um, who did it in the 30s. And then we had Kinsey through the 50s. And then basically nothing. They were very understudied after that. We're just now starting to get more oak taxonomists, particularly in Mexico, which is really great. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the hot spot for oaks, as far as the diversity of the most species, is Mexico. And so that's definitely where we're going to see the most gall wasps as well. And so the fact that we have a lot of really excited and enthusiastic researchers coming out of Mexico is really good news. But otherwise, there's going to be some debate over what your galls are. <laughs> Um, and in some cases we may not know, and that actually sometimes can be even more exciting. If we can tell you, we don't know what that is, it may be a new species. So take pictures, get them, you know, posted on some of the resources that I'm going to go over, um, and you can definitely, uh, help participate in science. 
So I just kind of reduced what was on the upper part of the screen so that I could show you some of these uh, resources. Uh, some of the older ones, I'm not going to go over in too much detail. Uh, these were publications that came out. Uh, Weld in 1959 um, is probably the most comprehensive resource. Um, he published this paper uh, as a monograph of Sinipid Gauls of the Eastern US. He also has other monographs of the other parts of the US. Uh, but this, you searched by host plant. And then once you're looking at your host plant, you looked at the tissue type and it told you all the species of galls or gall wasps that he found on that host plant. So it was really comprehensive. Uh, felt from 1940 um, was also an excellent resource, um, but both of those are pretty out of date. And so now what we're looking at um, is things like iNaturalist and a website called Gall Formers. So I'm sure you guys have probably talked about iNaturalist, but uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's an app that you can put on like your phone or other um, device. You can upload pictures. It usually helps, um, it can sometimes help you identify them, but then it puts the image out there. Um, you need to make sure that you have a, uh, the correct uh, uh, like date and location where you found it. Um, and then there are people out there that will help identify that for you. And some of the people that help identify um, are the people that use or that uh, form gall formers. Uh, I'll go in more depth with gall formers here in just a moment. Um, but for the, uh, well, also wanted to mention before we move on to the next slide that there's a good resource for oak identification. It is also somewhat out of date at this point, but eFloras.org uh, has a pretty good key and a lot of pictures for helping identify oaks. All right, so with iNaturalist, um, so there's a whole section for oak gall wasps. Um, you can see all the different galls. So these aren't considered the organisms themselves. Um, there's actually a category for galls. So it's an evidence of an organism. And uh, you can see a couple of things I wanna point out. Uh, top right, the top identifier uh, goes by the name Megakyle. And uh, so he's one of the co-founders of the next resource, which is golf, um, uh, sorry, golfformers.org. Um, and so he spends a lot of time on iNaturalist identifying different oak galls. Uh, primarily so that we can not only have pictures of all the galls, uh, which we don't have currently, uh, but we also will get uh, information and data as far as when these galls are present in different parts of the country. Uh, so the graph that's underneath there kind of shows you that there's two peaks as far as when you observe galls. Uh, the big one is in the fall and summer. Uh, and so those are usually the more conspicuous galls as far as being more obvious um, and then in the spring, remember that little tiny grain gall that was in that bud? A lot of the spring galls are uh, what we call cryptic like that. And so crypsis is when it kind of blends in with the surroundings. And so a cryptic gall is kind of hard to tell the difference between it and the normal plant tissues. Um, and so a lot of the galls in the spring tend to be cryptic um, galls. Now for gall formers, so if you go to golfformers.org, you'll be on the homepage and you can explore this on your own. Um, I just realized I meant to, I, I mean, I have to change the way that I shared my screens. I actually wanted to show you this website, uh, but you can uh, identify goals. Actually, I'm kind of running a little bit late on time. So I won't show you the website too much. Maybe if we have time at the end, because um, I want to go through pictures of goals. But basically you can search on the host plant through species name or common name. Um, and it will bring up pictures and names of every gall maker that attacks that host plant. And it's not just oak galls. They have um, galls for a lot of different plants on here. And uh, so when you're going to identify your galls, this is gonna be an excellent resource for you. Um, I wish I had done a picture. Maybe afterwards we can show a little bit of what this website looks like. 
Uh, but most of the pictures I'm going to show you from here on out are from their website. So I can kind of show you what this looks like. But they also have a glossary there. So if there's any terms that you don't know uh, what you're looking at, um, I already kind of told you monothalamus and polythalamus being galls that have either one or many gall wasps that come out of them. Um, so there's other terms like that in the glossary. But uh, so I want to talk to you first about some of the galls, my favorite galls in your area. I'm going to concentrate first on those on the white oaks, uh, which is the section Quercus. Uh, I already talked um, to you a little bit about this one, the rough bullet gall wasp, uh, Quercus mama. So the name Quercus mama uh, comes from the first part of it, Quercus is oak, and mama means breast. And so basically what this is, is this is a round, almost kind of like spherical gall, but then it has a little point or what we call a nipple on it. So yes, some oaks do have nipples, uh, but these galls, so it's basically oak breast. <laughs> uh, and a lot of um, oak gall wasp names will have Quercus as the beginning part um, or ending part uh, with some sort of attachment on this. Um, and so these guys create uh, detachable woody twig galls. So you can actually kind of pluck these galls off of the stems. Um, and you'll see these developing through the summer um, and then they mature in the fall. And by mature, I mean they turn brown and woody. Um, they do have a nipple. And this is one of the species that secretes, um, I say honeydew, um, some people call it nectar. It's more similar to honeydew, uh, but so if you don't let the insects or the other animals harvest this um, honeydew, uh, which is what I did in this case, it will literally just drip off the galls. It secretes so much of this uh, sugary secretion um, where it's trying to attract those ants. Um, and so this is actually kind of a really cool aspect. And you can see in this case, these galls are not mature. And so they're not brown yet. Um, sometimes they'll be green and pink. So they can be really pretty when they're um, younger. Now I mentioned the other generation. So this would be the sexually reproducing generations gall. And you can see the little hole, you know, near the tip of it where the gall wasp, you know, chewed its way out. It's kind of cute. Another species in the same genus that I really like that's in your area um, is Quercus globulus. So if we look at that name, it's basically oak blob. <laughs> So our lovely little oak blobs, you'll find them on white oak, as well as uh, like sandpost oak, chestnut oak, uh, the dwarf chinkapin oak, and uh, regular post oak. Uh, this is actually quite a few species of oak for this gall wasp to be found on, and that's partially because white oak hybridizes with a lot of different species of oak. She's, yeah, she's definitely um, hybridizes a lot. And so uh, I think because of that, a lot of the gall wasps that attack white oak tend to attack a lot of other hosts. Uh, and so these are also detachable woody galls um, that you'll find in the same summer and fall season, but they're not gonna have a nipple. They're gonna be a little bit smoother. Um, they're not gonna have the honeydew secretions and they're usually not occurring in as high of numbers as well. So they're a little bit harder to find. So you're lucky if you find some of these. Another of my favorite galls on white oaks that I love is the wool sour gall. Some of you have probably seen this and you were probably like, what is this? <laughs> it's white, it's fluffy, it's pink. Um, it's caused by the gall wasp Caloritis seminator. And you'll find this on white oak, um, swamp chestnut oak and chestnut oak. And while it's adorable, at this stage, um, as you move on and it starts to mature, those pink spots will start to turn brown. And then eventually this will shift into what looks like this. And so uh, you can see there's actually many galls inside this cluster. And they're looking kind of like those little bud galls where they're like these little grain looking things. But then at the tip, they had this like little crown of fuzz um, that was creating the wool um, around the gall. And so like I had mentioned from the great question earlier, uh, fuzzy galls um, are a defensive strategy. It's much harder for them to access the galls down at the middle than at the center of this ball um, if it's completely surrounded in all this fluff. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about a particular species in this case. I'm going to talk about the entire genus because it's just that fabulous. We have the hedgehog galls, uh, which are the genus Acraspis. And when they're um, immature galls, they're bright colors and they're on leaves. Uh, and you'll find them, you know, bright uh, yellows and oranges and reds and pinks. And they're kind of spiny or hairy or bumpy, depending on the species. And you'll see these developing throughout summer and they'll, um, and th then again in the fall. Um, and they're just really, really pretty. And they're just a really cool group. Now their other generation, their spring gall, their sexual generation is a very similar uh, bud gall, but the buds have the scales that cover them. Most Acraspis spring galls are gonna be a swelling of those scales rather than a, you know, a gall nestled in the middle. It's gonna be, they're gonna be galling the outer scales of that bud. Um, and there are definitely many species of Acraspis where we have not found the sexual generation. So keep an eye out for that this spring. Another species that I love, and feel free, um, sorry, uh, feel free to stop me if I'm going over on time, um, but I'm just kind of showing some pictures here. Uh, so but some you, of my you, other favorites. You keep, you keep going, we're, we're, we're all enjoying this. You keep going. Okay. As long as you can. <laughs> All right, so uh, Quercus or Andricus uh, Quercus strobilanus. Uh, this is a really cool species, different genus um, than what we've talked about so far. Uh, big genus, uh, very diverse. But this particular species, they create these like inverted cone shaped galls. So it's the tip, the pointy part of the gall that is attached, and it's just kind of got this middle point and all these galls radiating from that point. And when they're developing, they can be uh, pinks, purples, you know, tans, yellows, oranges, uh, very, very pretty. And then they mature in the fall uh, and uh, that's when the gall wasp will emerge. Now, another genus that I really like is Phyllotarus. And so this is one species of this genus that I really like. And they create what we call cup-shaped galls. So they're kind of cylindrical, but then they are hollow in the middle. <laughs> Very interesting morphology or like appearance for these galls. And I just kind of wanted to show you. So you're going to find those on bur oak and swamp white oak. Uh, and then uh, the next is also another phyllotarist species. These ones kind of create these little like what we call spangle or button galls. So they're like little discs. Uh, and you'll find these on the underside of leaves of like uh, white oak and chestnut oak and bur oak. Uh, this is the asexual generation of this species. Um, and you'll find it on the underside of leaves. And they're oftentimes pink or purple, really pretty. On, uh, so some of these species are gonna be more in the South um, and kind of central US, uh, but like post oak, Quercus stellata, um, and then also uh, Quercus muhlenbergii. Uh, you'll find in your area. Uh, these galls uh, from Andricus lustrans, um, they're clustered together. They're kind of cylindrical or sub-cylindrical, um, but they're very interesting looking on these. Um, one thing I wanted to mention with this is that we have these galls in museum collections found as far north as New York, but on iNaturalist, we have seen absolutely no records of this species. So we think that they've gone through a possible reduction in range. Even with post oak still existing farther up north, we can't find it anywhere except for down in like the Texas area. So be on the lookout for the species. If you find this, that will be big news. And then another one of my favorite groups, the genus Etrusca. Uh, they create these big cylindrical, or not cylindrical, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> big round, completely spherical uh, galls, oftentimes spotted. The reason why I think they're so cool is that when they mature, for the most part, they're hollow on the inside, except they have these really thin little spindle-like hairs that are suspending the larval cell in the middle of the gall. This is another defensive strategy. Try and reach me if you can. <laughs> so this is kind of a really cool way that this particular genus um, has 
uh, basically evaded many of its natural enemies. And you're gonna find this particular species of Etrusca gall um, on post oak, but you'll find other species of Etrusca on other hosts as well. I wanted to mention the genus uh, Trigonaspis as well. Uh, they're gonna have very similar galls to the last genus, but they're gonna be a little bit smaller. Um, and so these are probably gonna be, uh, their radius is gonna be less than like a, the size of a quarter, US quarter. Um, whereas the other ones could be a little bit larger. Uh, but this species, you can see they can, you know, there's a leaf gall. Um, and they can occur in quite high numbers, but they're quite pretty. And they actually almost look like tasty, I wanna say, <laughs> but I don't suggest eating them. Uh, but they will also have those radiating spindles on the inside. I did wanna mention um, at least one flower gall. So on the catkins that you'll see this spring, check out those catkins, because if you see these little swellings, they're galls. Um, so this is just one of the species that you'll find um, galling flowers. And then more fuzzy galls, another uh, genus, Neuroterus, big genus. This genus tends to be uh, they're more generalized. Um, so they'll attack more species than most gall wasps. Uh, but a lot of them will cause little tiny fuzzy galls. And these are very small gall wasps. And so you'll see this particular species, uh, Neuroterus quercus verrucum. Um, on the underside of leaves, uh, both in the summer and fall. Uh, and oftentimes they cause the leaf to kind of deform and curl around them. So check out deformed leaves. You might find some galls there. Now, I do not specialize on galls and red oaks, but I did kind of want to mention some of my favorites. Uh, similar genus to some of the ones that had this uh, larval cells uh, suspended by uh, spindles, the spongy oak apples uh, from the genus Amphibolops, uh, they're gonna have like a spongy material um, and it kind of dries out and becomes a little bit more stringy um, when they're mature, uh, but these will be large either uh, leaf or petiole galls. Um, and so they'll have like a fuzzy spongy uh, inside to them and it will hold the larval cell in the middle. Uh, very cool uh, as they're maturing. These can get kind of large, uh, even though they're called oak apples. As I said, I don't suggest trying to eat them. Tannins are usually not that yummy <laughs> um, when they're in oak galls. Uh, another species, uh, so those ones were very round. And this species, they're like spindle shaped. Uh, and so they're kind of like elongate, but they're still spongy on the inside like that. And it's just kind of a very interesting uh, appearance to these balls. So I really like the species as well. And you'll find that on Quercus marylandica. So keep your eye out for that. Uh, this ball is very interesting. Uh, so it's uh, by species Dryocosmus Quercus polustris. Uh, this is the sexual generation of the species, so males and females. Uh, they're leaf galls and they're integral to the leaf. So you can't just detach them from the leaf without ripping the leaf. Uh, but the larval cell is free rolling within this. It's not attached to anything. And so it's for as far as like parasitoids trying to aim for it, it's like, where do they try to aim because it's, you know, obviously it would be sitting at the bottom, but I highly doubt the parasitoids know very much about gravity. And so they would not know to go looking in that particular spot for the larval cell. Um, and so this is also another defensive strategy. And they're kind of like crisp grapes. Um, it's interesting, the texture of these galls. This is a very interesting gall. I have not seen this one myself. It's kind of on my bucket list. Um, and you'll find this on Northern Red Oak and some others, uh, the striate oak gall. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe that this is caused by a wasp. I mean, obviously this is something completely unnatural to the oak. Um, it's just kind of really out of there. Um, it's just very interesting looking and it can be a large variety of colors when it's uh, still immature as well. Very cool gall. Some more fuzzy galls from the genus Calaritis. 
Uh, so these are some woolly leaf galls that you'll find in the summer and fall on the red oaks. Um, Something, some of the species that you'll find on the white oaks that are fuzzy are usually on the underside of leaves. Um, these ones can be on the upper sides of leaves as well. Um, a newer genus, um, so that has some older species that were brought into this genus, um, is Cococynips. And this particular species, uh, Riley I, uh, is I just think the gall is very interesting looking. It's basically a sphere with a little hat. And they're usually pink and spotted as they're maturing or as they're, you know, still doing uh, during the summer when they're still trying to mature. Uh, and they can be found on a lot of different species. So keep your eye open for this really cool gall. If you see it, I think you're pretty lucky. And then I also wanted to mention uh, a root gall. I haven't talked about root galls yet, um, but you definitely can find, particularly on the roots that are near the surface, um, you'll find galls like this. And so this particular species, um, this whole genus actually is known for alternating between like a root gall and like a leaf gall. Um, and so uh, these are some of the root galls and you'll find these in the summer and fall and they're kind of conical structure. And once again, you can see the holes where the gall wasps, you know, chewed their way out of the gall. Basically, that's kind of a little, you know, there's a lot more galls out there, but I want you to go out and discover them. But I do want to talk about a couple other fun things that you can do with galls. Um, I'm just a little bit of a bug nerd and I take it a little too seriously. So I do a lot of crafting involving insects and insect products. So I love galls. Um, I'm pretty much always wearing a gall necklace. Um, I've also made collages out of galls. These, this one uh, is about two feet by four feet and it uh, contains galls from five different species of gall wasps that I studied during my PhD. Uh, and so um, obviously there's a lot more diversity than the woody twig galls. So you can make some really pretty uh, collages uh, using galls. But also I mentioned dyes um, and inks, and I played around with those. The purple on this scarf was actually from cochineal, which is a type of insect, a scale insect that we get red dyes from. Um, but then the gray that's uh, striping that, uh, that is from oak galls. And I made that dye in a similar way to how you make ink. Uh, and I've also, I do a lot with ink. Um, and then just kind of as a joke, uh, I did this little art project with the entomology club here at Colorado State University. We made a uh, gall wasps, a nice little pun for you there. So we made wasps out of galls. Um, but you'll notice on the picture to the left, uh, the markings on the center part, uh, that was with gall ink. And we did the markings that were specific to that genus of gall wasp. <laughs> so we made it a little bit scientific. But all right, so, well, go find some galls. Um, this little video here at the bottom, I'm just gonna uh, mute it. Um, uh, if you guys have any questions, I will take questions. Uh, the galls that you see hopping around at your bottom of your screen, those are uh, from the genus Neuroterus. Uh, there's a couple species that can do this and it's the larva basically um, moving around inside the gall that makes them jump kind of like uh, you think of jumping beans. Um, those are larvae inside of a seed. And um, so very similar to that, we have gall wasps that can do um, some movement as well inside the gall. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cook. This was amazing. Love this. You have, you have, some, you have created some gall followers, um, <laughs> some gall disciples here to convert it. Uh, let's come back together and, and do some Q&A. There are lots of questions uh, in the chat. Um, All right, let me see. I'm opening up the chat. Well, if you, um, can you unshare? We'll come back. I'll put, yeah, I'll stop put the share. Up. There we go. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. Uh, let me scroll so up a little way, bit. Yeah, so way back in, um, some people ask that they look like a little, some of them look like fungi. And is, could that be a defensive mechanism to look like fun, fun, fungi? Or, and there was Possibly. also a question about the 
coloration was the red color is also a defensive mechanism. Yes, that's called aposematic coloration. And normally with aposematic coloration, it's the organism themselves that's colored. And so this is actually a very interesting case where they have extended that aposematic coloration to their extended phenotype. And it's very interesting. And there've been some really cool studies that have looked at that. So it's definitely a warning that the gall is toxic. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to know uh, about where are the chemoreceptors located on the wasp body? How do they, how do they figure that out? So um, they will, most of them are gonna be on the antennae. Some of them are gonna be on the mouth parts. And then usually a lot of wasps, especially the parasitic wasps, will have um, a, some chemoreceptors on the tip of their ovipositor, which is the part of the body that they use to lay eggs. And that's usually to let them know once they hit gold. So uh, yeah, you'll, and then they have other different types of receptors all over their body as well. Um, but those are the main areas for chemoreceptors. Um, Nala was asking about the ethics and scientific value of dissecting a gall to take pictures of it for the iNaturalist post. Do you have to do that or? Um... You don't have to open the gall. Um, so usually just taking a picture of the gall itself, maybe also getting like a picture of the leaves um, to kind of help with the, identifying the host plant is usually all we need. Um, the wasp larva usually isn't. Um, really that important for us or really that useful except for maybe as a you know for DNA. Uh, usually what we want for scientific research would be the adult. So we actually collect the galls and then we rear out the adults. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that if you or if you want to do that, you can definitely contact some researchers. Uh, even just putting your pictures up on iNaturalist, some of them will contact you <laughs> um, if you find something interesting enough. So uh, wanting to know if you're willing to collect those wasps for them or the galls and send them the galls. Uh, as far as the ethics behind, um, like, you know, if you do open a gall before the gall wasp has emerged, um, in most cases, it will end up killing that gall wasp. But you think about the number of galls you have over a whole tree, we usually don't feel too bad about collecting a few because it's not really harming too much of the population. Uh, where this starts to uh, become more of an issue. I mentioned that most oaks, uh, like a majority of oaks are actually like in the Mexico, in like the Mexican mountains. Um, that surprises a lot of people. The other thing that surprises them is that most or like a large proportion of oaks are not trees. Most of them are what we would consider shrubs um, or like what we call shin oaks that only come up to your knee. Um, and so if you go and harvest like all the galls off of, you know, a couple plants in that area, you may actually be kind of detrimentally harming those populations. So on those smaller oaks, we have to be much more conscious about how much we're collecting. Um, Virginia was interested in the benefit of the sexual, asexual alternation. So I have some theories on that, uh, mostly from my observations here in Colorado um, during my master's when I was studying that one species and trying to get the full life cycle. Um, the asexually reproducing generation that only comes out in the fall, they come out in like November, December. And so like, here in Colorado, they're like grasping on to the little tree branch, trying to oviposit their eggs while there's like snow blowing around them. Um, and so I think it's probably the asexual reproduction may allow them to oviposit during, you know, without having to mate during times of the year when mating may not be an option. Uh, and so, but then with the sexual reproduction, um, there's genetic benefits there um, as well, but there's also some genetic benefits to passing on 100% of your genes um, and the asexual producing generation. So there's benefits to both. Um, there are some oak gall wasps, well, one, the uh, chestnut oak gall wasp um, that I had mentioned is invasive. Um, that's the only gall wasp that we have confirmed so far that has completely lost the sexual generation. They're only asexually reproducing. Um, the question uh, was, 
So galls that grow in the clusters, are they all the galls laid by one wasp or from different wasps? As far as we know, they're all from one wasp. That's a very good question. Do you have an Etsy site? <laughs> I used to. Um, I do stuff on commissions. Right now I'm actually running really low on my favorite species of gall. Um, but I'm hoping that I'll be coming out to Delaware soon. And if that's the case, I'm going to go collect more galls. While we do have the same species here in Colorado, because there's no natural enemies, they, glow, they grow to cluster together. So they're deformed. So I need good old Maryland galls. <laughs> so I'm gonna come collect some myself, hopefully here um, in the next month or two. Um, and then, yeah, I could probably take on some more commissions at that point. <laughs> oh, and also um, on that note, the jewelry that I do make when I sell it, it benefits the entomology club. Um, all the proceeds, all the um, profit go to the entomology club here at CSU. I'm also trying to set up a relationship with the entomology organization at University of Maryland, but they haven't responded to me yet. So um, just so you know, for the oak jewelry, uh, oak gall jewelry, that's usually where the proceeds are. Well, we do have some people on, um, on, the, on the talk tonight that are from the Maryland Entomological Society, and we're also connected to the uh, UMD folks like doc, Dr. Mike Roth and things like that. I'm sure you came across him. Um, we'll get the we'll get the word out and tell them to contact you. And then when you come in town, can we come and and, and go golf looking for with you? <laughs> Might be able to. Um, it was going to be. I usually when I'm wanting to collect a large number of galls, I go for the low hanging fruit. I go to tree nurseries uh, because they have short trees where you don't have to use ladders. And then also usually their oaks are all uh, what we call monotypic. So they're um, basically it's all one basic genetic makeup. Uh, they're all so closely related to each other. Sometimes they're actually clones of each other. And so there's not much genetic diversity. And so there's not very much gall resistance. And so it's usually the easiest way for me to collect high numbers. But if I do get to come out and collect, I'll ask the tree farm if I can bring some people with me. <laughs> that we, you have a, a bunch of people who would love to go with you. Are there any tips if we're out there um, walking around? Because I know that everybody's gonna be excited and wanna go out tomorrow mm -hmm. because it's gonna be raining, but go out and look for galls. Um, all there, you know, so what, what should we be looking for and how should we be looking? I mean, for the most part, it's you're just looking for anything that might be abnormal. But if you're not really familiar with oaks, at first, you're not going to really know and you're going to miss a lot. But the more you look very closely at oaks, the more familiar you're going to, you know, familiar you're going to become. And then you're going to be like, wait, that bud scale swollen or, you know, like that catkin has some swellings on it um, or that acorn cap has a small gall sticking out from underneath it and um, so basically you're just looking for anything that's abnormal uh, the spring galls the little bud galls that I found um, so if you look at the buds the, as they start to elongate you're going to see some that are still short and fat look inside of those ones <laughs> because it kind of um, the bud galls some of them will kind of like not really destroy the meristem which is the part that the plant you know grows from um, but they at least stunt it sometimes and so the shorter fatter little buds that aren't elongating as quickly um, look in those and you'll very likely find something uh, otherwise I mean you just gotta look at all the different tissues um, until you become really familiar with things uh, looking uh, for exit holes and then realizing like, oh, okay, so that was a gall. And then the next year when it comes around, you know what to look for. Uh, yeah, so basically just spend a lot of time looking at plants. And like there's other plants that have galls on them. Uh, I get distracted all the time. Um, I'm a horrible person. Well, you guys would probably think I'm a wonderful person to hike with, but most hikers here in Colorado, <laughs> I'm just constantly stopping <laughs> and like examining plants up close because I'm looking for galls. They're just everywhere. 
Um, do oaks have the higher abundance of galls than other types of plants? Um, I want to say most likely yes, because of the oak gall wasps. There are also some uh, gall flies that attack oaks as well. Um, but as far as the oak gall wasps, they're most diverse in oaks, the oak gallers. Uh, and so I would think oaks probably have more galls than most things. All right. Any other questions for um, Dr. Cook tonight? I mean, I know we're just so excited and and thrilled to have something else to go and search for. But your homework all tonight is just go spend more time outside looking. looking yeah, closely. go to Golf Formers. Go to that website. It's really interesting. They're constantly updating it, uh, and I work with them, you know, frequently. Uh, so yeah, it's a really great resource for you guys. Um, Gail asked, did ash trees have galls also? Ash trees. Um, if they do, it would be gall flies. Uh, I'm not positive off the top of my head though. Um, I'm trying to think, I have ash trees on my property, but they're not native here. So they may not have the gall inducers. Um, I haven't noticed any on my trees, but I never really looked at ashes out east. I would look on uh, gall formers. I bet you it <laughs> says on there. If you look up uh, Fraxinus, the genus Fraxinus, it'll come up. <laughs> um, you said that, oh, do, 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 do. I just missed it. Um, the flies are pests for crops. What are some crops impacted by galls? Well, for instance, um, there was a new species of gall fly that was found on soybean. So we started planting soybean in the US and um, this fly just appeared. Um, they didn't know what it was and they weren't really able to find effective controls for it because it was undescribed. I think it took eight years for my colleague Ray Gagne to finally describe the species. And by that point, it was causing severe damage to our soy crops. Um, but there's a lot of gall flies. There's, I think there's some on like cruciferous crops. I mean, gall flies, they attack a lot of different types of plants. But the soybeans, the one I know off the top of my head. <laughs> Any other questions tonight? What I love about it is that there's just so much that we know and so much that we don't know, and it's it's a fascinating subject. And there's the, we can get involved. And um, anybody that finds a species, you can name it after me. C R O N W Y N. Name your wasp after me. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Cook. This has been fabulous. And please, if you are coming to Delaware or Maryland, let us know um, so you can we can come and play with you in the woods. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank Thanks. you so Thanks. much for having me. Thanks so Such much. Such a great talk. Talk. Lovely comments off to the side. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay well. Stay curious. Stay outside. And start looking for those goals. And let us know if you find any. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. Bye.